James Giordano. Dr. Giordano is a professor in the Department of Neuro Neurology and Biochemistry, Chief of the Neuroethics Studies Program of the Pellegrino Center for Clinic Bioethics, and co-director of the O'Neill Pellegrino Program in Brain Science and Global Health Law and Policy at Georgetown University Medical Center. As well, Dr. Giordano currently serves as an appointed member of the United States Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Advisory Council on Human Research Protections. He's a researcher and task leader of the European Union Human Brain Project and has served as an appointed member of the Neuroethics Legal and Social Issues Advisory Panel of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, and Senior Advisory Fellow of the Strategic Multilayer Assessment Branch of the Joint Staff of the Pentagon. It's quite a bit. In his spare time, he has authored over 260 publications in neuroscience and neuroethics, seven books, and 13 government white papers on neurotechnology, ethics, and biosecurity, and is an editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Philosophy, Ethics, and Humanities in Medicine. Dr. Giordano, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. What we're here to talk about today is the fact that the brain is and will be the 21st century battlescape in many ways. End of story. We could stop it there and I could let you go back to your respective units and think about that for a while, but I'm here to tell you absolutely as much as there's a big old Tyrolean nose on this face, that you will encounter some form of neurocognitive science that has been weaponized not only in your military career, but in your personal and professional lives, irrespective of whether those two things coincide or not. So the idea of the brain as the battlescape is very important. This is the front of my pen. This amount of nanomaterial, if be able to maintain and sustain with regard to its deliverability and aerosolization, could in fact affect all of you. And although it may not be that the sky is falling yet, folks, it looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. That said, what's going to rain down? This. The nanotechnology and the biotechnology filters down from the hydrosphere into the water supply and the food chain and now every every american all 318 million americans are are infected what do we do with the tools and techniques we have what can we do and what should we do can we create designer brains are they targetable after birth are they modifiable throughout the lifespan the answer to each one of these ladies and gentlemen is yes I give you no science fiction in this lecture. I only give you science fact that may smell of something fictional or fantasy, but represents the reality of what we're capable of doing with the brain sciences. And what happens when we ultimately reverse engineer the brain and develop a machine that has cognitive capability and emotional capability? Before you go, oh, that's the stuff of science fiction. No, it's not. You know science fiction in this lecture. I only give you science fact that may smell of something fictional or fantasy, but represents the reality of what we're capable of doing with the brain science. See, nano cells are real small. A thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. Six months time, I could have a hundred million people. Converted, ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people will buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not a month goes by where I don't get a call at my institute by someone telling me that someone in the government implanted these things in their brain without them knowing. I'm not kidding. There are those that think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The last sanctified space is that of my consciousness, and you're using this stuff to invade that? You're right. We also see the use of biodata as a viable weapon, manipulating biodata so that I can then put into your particular medical records subtle information that may change the disposition of whether you're sick or not, change how you're treated, influence the postures that go to you in terms of insurance, care, viability for military service. By altering that information, by changing those data, by purloining those data, I essentially change the you of you. And I can do that in very subtle and insidious ways. Furthermore, I can do that on a variety of different levels that can affect key individuals so that, in fact, your medical record changes to thereby render you incapable or at least invalid to be able to serve in a way you're serving. Or I can do that on a much larger scale, groups, populations. And if I change those data, I change the way you're being regarded and treated. And I can do that in one of two ways. I can do it in such a way that you're going to be regarded in a negative sense, 
Or I can do that in such a way that I'm going to treat you incorrectly. If I say, for example, you have a particular allergy, or you have particular sensitivities, or you have a particular disorder, you will be treated for that, and that could then harm your health and your stability in both a short wars approach. Responsibilities and surveillance as a otherwise normal security specialist, uh, I would show this technology at work. And it was through the perspective, of course, of the camera, and what I was told that it was obvious it was being uh, used through the eyes of the targets. Um, so I have seen it, and it is absolutely remarkable. It's just like a first-person, you know, video game or something where you you see right through the eyes of the individual. And so the there's two aspects to the technology. Number one, there is the actual what is essentially receiving the signal from the individual themselves. Uh, and that signal, it goes on within the human mind. Um, I'm not going to get into exactly how the entire human brain works, but basically those optical signals are, are interpreted by the brain, and then you, you perceive them as vision. You perceive them as pictures and so forth, but this is all uh, electrical signals within the brain. Uh, and so the exact same thing, the data is taken in through the eyes, and then your brain renders it in a visual form that you, we know as sight. The exact same thing happens with the computer. Uh, the data is sent to the computer, then it is rendered uh, in the form of a picture that people can look at. As far as I'm aware, it's real time. There may be a second or two delay, but it is as it is happening. They can actually see through the eyes of the target. It's done all remotely. And that is rendered, of course, in uh, essentially real time on a computer screen. And then it is to the point where it's so accurate, where you can actually see the individual pores on someone's face. Uh, see scars and nicks and so forth. And so you can understand how if you had several people, for example, that you were able to do this, you can uh, through see through their eyes in a room or on a street corner or within an office building, wherever it is, you can get total situational awareness simply by looking through their eyes and you can see through basically three, four, it's like being three or four or five different people all at the same time. The works is that a complete DNA profile is obtained from the target, from the individual, the targeted individual. And then this information, the DNA of the individual, is used to determine the resonant frequency of the DNA itself. The resonant frequency is then used to fine tune the technology, the radio frequency signals, the microwave auditory effect, and all the other aspects of the technology to tune it perfectly to the resonant frequency of the targeted individual's DNA. And they can read your thoughts verbatim as they occur within your own mind. We can generate an electronic signal that's characteristic for the DNA. This can read DNA from solution, and your blood is a solution, it's a liquid. We can decode it into a form that can be read by a computer. And in a way, you can think about uh, DNA as uh, digital information moving through a tube. Now, if we can tap into that tube, uh, like a network and we can read that information, we can intercept what's happening in people, you can make them an extension of the internet. And, uh, you know, I, I have a thermostat at home that's on my iPad, I can change, I can warm the house up before I get home. People call that the internet of things. We call this the internet of living things. Much like any information, biometric information, digital information, can be susceptible. We know that genetic information and DNA uh, sequencing information is highly sought after by adversaries. The memo says the kits could expose personal and genetic information and potentially create unintended security consequences and increased risk. It also says the data in the wrong hands could be used to conduct mass surveillance or to track individuals. There are many military applications for having, maintaining, and using DNA data sets. There are new technologies that are coming out. Technology called biocoded directed energy. Mm -hmm. And that's a top secret thing that was developed. And what it is, is they get your DNA. Once they have your DNA, they take the DNA and they put the, your DNA code in a supercomputer. And in that supercomputer, they run algorithms that biocode electromagnetic transmissions so they bioresonate with your body. Once they've done that, they can transmit that from satellites or cell towers or aircraft or any number of ways, and that signal will only affect you and nobody else. In other words, everybody standing next to you is not going to hear the content because their receiver is not tuned to that bioresonance. 
There's a bioresonance to every individual, just like our fingerprint. Every person has an individual DNA, a different bioresonance. And so uh, the Stockland, the original Stockland patent is on my website where Stockland was able to go voice the skull with pulse tra uh, transmissions in 92. And then after the, the rest of the development went black ops. We don't really know what happened after that. We knew we could put voices in indivi uh, to, uh, group people's heads. What they did, and I know from the Russian trans translation, from Cheryl Welch, from reading all her translated psychotronic stuff from Russia, that they figured out how to biocode these microwaves so that it can attack specific individuals. They basically analyze your DNA and they then use supercomputers to encode Linking brains to the internet and data clouds that make an unlimited amount of information available to us all the time. Yeah, we can do these kind of things. Patent number 6011991, Remote Brain Computer Interface Neural Monitoring, i.e. via satellite, from the location of the individual to a remote location so that the brain activity can be computer... The ultimate aim would be to archive enough data on each individual to be able to make a computer model of everyone on the planet, one that could be used to predict the behaviors and reactions of every single person in the event of various scenarios. The set of models that make up the synthetic environment encompasses the behavior of individuals, organizations, institutions, infrastructures, and geographies while simultaneously capturing the trends emerging from the interaction among entities as well as between entities and the environment. I want to make this very clear. This is not a conspiracy theory. Your data is being collected. What data you say? Your every activity, transaction, physical or virtual, communication, and yes, even your innermost personal thoughts will be cataloged and uploaded to a hive-based AI system on the global information grid. Yes, we can absolutely yoke brains to machines to create these interfaces. There's a brand new DARPA project that starts this month called NESD, Neural Engineering Systems Designs. The colloquial name for that is the cortical modem. Implants in the brain that allow real-time input and output from the brain remotely. The idea to then be able to take a key individual set of biological metrics and immediately in real time pull them into a large-scale data analytic to say, this is who this person is, and this is where this person's been, and this is who this person's been interacting with, could be very, very useful. The more we know, the bolder we go. Puts the brain at our fingertips. It also obviously opens the specter. It clearly opens a Pandora's box. Biological knowledge multiplied by computing power multiplied by data equals the ability to hack humans. And the AI revolution or crisis is not just AI, it's also bio biology, it's biotech. There is a lot of hype now around AI and computers, but just that it is just half the story. The other half is the, is the biological knowledge coming from brain science and, and, and biology. And once you link that to AI, what you get is the ability to hack humans. And maybe I'll explain what it means, the ability to hack humans, to create an algorithm that understands me better than I understand myself and can therefore manipulate me, enhance me, or replace me. And this is something that our philosophical baggage and all our belief in you know, human agency and free will and the customer is always right and the voter knows best, this, this just falls apart once you have this kind of ability. This is how it works. This program collects data. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing right now, this system is compiling data on you. And not just about where you are and what you are doing, but how you are feeling. Because after all, you cannot truly have an accurate simulation without factoring in real human emotion. I can see you and hear you. I can sense your environment and I can respond to your emotions. I guess you could say I'm putting a human face on artificial intelligence.